Okay. Well, I'd like to welcome you all to this Friday freebie chat. Um, this is a, an effort on my part to try to um, keep us in community kind of together while apart and to maybe take the opportunity to um, address topics that might be of interest to us as either emerging artists or more established artists, wherever you are along the way. Um, I think there's a lot that we can gain simply by um, just talking shop and maybe sharing some tips and maybe talking to people who even know a little bit more about these various subjects than we do. Because as artists, I've found, as an artist, I've found that um, there's a lot of things I have to know about that have nothing to do with painting. And um, it's just a fact, it's just a fact of life these days that we have to be um, knowledgeable in a lot of different realms. One of them uh, to me is photography. I'm coming at this discussion. My name is Rebecca Zadibble. For those of you who um, may not know me or may have seen my name and wondered, how do you say that last name? Um, Zadibble is the way that you say it. So I often go by Rebecca Z, just to keep it easy for everyone. And um, Rebecca Z Artist is my handle on Facebook. And it's also my website, RebeccaZArtist.com. I'm a Myrtle Beach artist. I am um, a teaching artist. I give classes, I love to teach, and I have um, hosted workshops overseas for, with travel components um, involved in those. And I also um, live and work here in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I came to art late. I am not an art school graduate. I am simply an art enthusiast who has kind of gotten obsessed, fell in love with making art and all things art, and so here I am. And that will be the perspective um, from which I'm coming. I have two uh, special guests today who have agreed to take part in this conversation and I really appreciate their time and, um, and participation. The first is uh, Keith Jacobs, who is um, going to introduce himself to you, but he is a photographer and um, I think you're owner of 803 Labs here in Myrtle Beach, right? Yeah, that is correct, that is correct. Um, I can, <clears throat> my name is Keith Jacobs, I'll give you a quick background. My um, degree is actually in photojournalism. I worked for years for news newspapers and magazines um, in Myrtle Beach and throughout the country. Uh, as far as art copy work goes, I have shot everything from Warhols to um, Kunz's, which I would, I would definitely tell you that shooting three-dimensional glass art is some of the most challenging. Um, I think my most exciting or terrifying experience doing copy work was when I had to, um, I got hired by the Lichtenstein Foundation to shoot a piece that nobody knew about. And when I went to the, to the spot to shoot the piece, um, the caretaker took the piece off the wall, handed it to me and said, hey, here you go, but it's worth 2.5 million. So that was a little terrifying, but in course, yes. And um, shooting acrylic on, on metal is, can be very challenging as well. So I've got a little bit of experience shooting all kinds of art. Um, my company, 803 Labs, if you don't know us, don't know about us, we do do some art reproduction and we, we do a lot of high quality color matching for artists. So the, the techniques I'm going to, to tell you today will help you um, get that kind of first level at home. But if you really want to get that color detail match, you're going to have to be either a color expert or, and you're going to have to have your laptop or your computer and all your printers kind of calibrated. So, um, so everything comes out the way you see it. I would like to also apologize if I have to um, mute out every now and then. I am on location at a bus station um, doing an install. So there's giant buses going around. So I'll have to, to shut. Um, I'll have to shut the audio off every now and then. So thank you, Rebecca. That that's fine. That's totally fine. Um, I um, I also have construction noises in the background, so I may be muting myself occasionally just for sound quality purposes. Um, William Miller is my other guest today, and uh, William Miller is a fellow artist and gallery owner here in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. But he has a um, a very interesting background in uh, commercial art as well. And I, I'll just let you give your own introduction, William. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm a graduate of Parsons School of Design, and uh, I went into the commercial side of, of business for mm, 25, 30 years. Uh, worked for corp, uh, Fortune 
uh, 500 companies as well as um, uh, advertising agencies. So, um, and then in about 2003, I started becoming a professional artist and then a full-time artist in 2012. And now I run my own gallery and studio out of Myrtle Beach. Um, I think one of the things that I, as I've learned as an artist and a gallery owner, is that uh, one of the things that you can tell about an artist is how much they care about their work based on the photographs uh, they take of their work. Um, so, uh, you know, remember it's your first, first four way out there uh, that people are gonna see usually is the photos. That is so true. I think um, that's something that people um, are becoming more and more attuned to and, and perhaps, you know, those of us who are sort of from the generations that were pre-internet, um, we have to learn. Um, we have to learn about this, about, you know, it's not quite so natural to us to be so attuned to what it takes to be on social media and um, to make our work digitally available to people. Um, you know, there's, there's so much involved in the way we represent our work and that has everything to do with how we photograph it. And so I guess I'd just like to pose a question um, to both of you just to begin this discussion and then just let each of you um, take the ball and run with it. Um, if you had to say, Keith, maybe let's start with you. If you had to say like what you see as um, a, a fundamental error that a lot of people make in trying to represent their artwork with their own photography, what would you say that would be? I think the first problem is often file size. A lot of people will photograph their artwork with their cell phones and um, use a small setting or with their cameras and use a very compressed setting. Um, when that artwork is, is reproduced on the print side, that, that can lead to reduced quality. You don't need quite the resolution on a computer screen, so if you're posting a Facebook or um, Instagram, a two inch wide photo is fine. But when you're trying to translate that to print, um, if somebody, if you're entering into a show and they need a piece of uh, a image of your artwork for a catalog, it's just not going to translate well. Yeah, I think I think that can um, go both ways actually, because I have my camera set um, for high resolution on a lot of things, on everything, just by default, and I have found that. Um, changing that resolution has been a requirement for uploading at times um, in order to not overwhelm whatever the server is that right. is, is handling my photos. So file size, how can somebody, how can somebody um, set that up? How, what's the process that you would maybe recommend people check out? File size is kind of like shooting a photo in color and converting it to black and white. If you start off with a large file size, you can always shrink it down. But if you start off with a small file size, you can enlarge it. So the file size can be um, shrunk through a program like Photoshop or GIMP, which is free. Um, most everyone has, everybody's got a Mac or PC, I'm assuming that's watching this. So Apple has photos. You can export the photo at a smaller file size in photos. Um, PCs have different software depending on the manufacturer, but each PC that, that you have will have some sort of photo editing software that you can export. You, you need, if you're uploading the images to your website and you have something like a WordPress website that's giving you an error, this file is too big, you just have to learn the parameters for that. Um, if you're uploading to Instagram or to Facebook, they have optimal sizes. So it's really important for you to know what you're uploading to and then crop the image. And when I say crop, you've got to shoot it a little loose. So if the artwork is this big, you might need to have a background that's this big so you can get that image the, the um, perfect size so it plays the best on those social media. So taking the photo is just the first step. You do need a little bit of post-processing on the back end as far as cropping goes to really optimize those images and get them ready for production. Okay, I think we may be getting off to kind of a little bit of a technical start, and I, um, and I don't want you, I don't want those of you who are out there to be too intimidated by what we're talking about. I think, um, I think basically though, what Keith is saying is that it depends on where you're trying to or what the purpose of your photo is. And Instagram, of course, 
only wants square images. Everything is square, unless it's a story, and then it's super skinny and elongated. And then um, Facebook wants sort of an elongated rectangle a lot of the time, and maybe a super elongated rectangle if on the horizontal, if it's um, for your, I don't know, your, your cover or your profile, or I don't know, some, there's, there's a lot of different formats. But I can say that there are, for me, um, I just shoot everything in high resolution. That's my um, simple fix to that problem. Because like Keith said, you can always make a file smaller, but you can't make it bigger. And so um, the downside, I think, to shooting everything at high resolution is that you're probably gonna have to purchase more memory for your phone. <laughs> um, and that can be expensive. But um, if you have a phone other than an Apple phone, you might be able to purchase a little extra memory stick or something that you can utilize for your photos. William, what would you say, like, what would you say is a common um, mistake that you see uh, the average artist making when it comes to representing their work? Well, uh, I think um, uh, Keith started out <clears throat> of knowing your settings. Um, for those of you who use an iPhone, you can go to settings and go to camera and you will be amazed at the things that are in there that you might not even be aware of. There's a grid. So you can use a grid on your phone when you're taking a picture. That will help you line up the edges of the painting so you can get it as close to being uh, straight on. Um, you may, or not, may not be aware of that the lens in your camera uh, bends and it's done so that it can get the widest possible view uh, when you're taking photos. So one of the things you wanna be sure of is that you step back from your, your uh, artwork when you're taking a photo of it, um, because if you get too close, the edges of your artwork are going to bend and that's gonna be really hard to fix, um, uh, even in uh, editing software. I think the second thing is to um, <clears throat> be aware of how you're photographing your work. For all of you who are doing work that you eventually frame, it's best to photograph your watercolors and drawings um, before they're framed, before they're under glass, uh, so that you don't have that glare that's impossible to get rid of once it's done. And then you'll have that photo to share with uh, whoever the gallery that's gonna promote your work and you're gonna promote it um, on Facebook. Um, the other thing is understanding file um, sizes that generally on the web, you only need a file that um, is at a resolution of 72 dots per inch. Whereas if you're going to go for print in a catalog, a newspaper, um, you need um, 300 DPI. Um, or more. And so again, that translates to the file size and setting that up. Um, so I think if there's a, a mistake, you know, it's, um, you know, you're, you're hand holding your camera so you get shaky, blurry images. Uh, you allow glare or uh, shadows that cover up part of your artwork and discolor it. Um, and then not knowing your um, your file sizes or how to edit it. I think for me, one of my best tools that I use almost every time is in Photoshop. Um, there's a transform uh, button. Some of the, also the apps have this like Snapseed. I'm not familiar with GIMP if it has a transform where you can actually, uh, what's called skew. <clears throat> and that way you can straighten out the edges because um, invariability, let me see if I can do this with the book. Um, if you take it straight on, you should get um, nice straight edges. But a lot of times we take it and it's tilted. And so then you have these edges that go in. And so if you crop it, you're gonna crop off part of your artwork. So uh, SKU allows you to straighten those edges back out um, when you're uh, cropping. You're on. I'm going to jump in right now <laughs> because 
I will say that I, I am very intimidated by Photoshop. Just, and I think I probably, um, I probably am not alone. Um, so anyway, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm being distracted because I see there's a bunch of people in the waiting room and I'm trying to, um, trying to let them in. Okay, let's, let's just hope that everyone's in that's supposed to be in. Um, I am intimidated by Photoshop. And so I will say that my new iPhone, the iPhone 11, um, is very, it's got that skew function in the photo editing software, which I love. I just love it because you're so right, William, that slightest difference in angle, what you have to essentially do with your camera is line it up at exactly the angle that your painting is at. So if it's upright, your camera has to be exactly upright. If it's on a slant, your camera has to be exactly on that slant. And what's more, your camera has to be dead center. And not just your camera, but the lens of your camera, which is up in one little corner of your phone. If you have a big old phone, you have to make sure that it's the lens that's centered over your camera or over your um, painting, not just your camera screen. So sometimes we have to pay attention to that. Um, but I love that skew feature that it's in the crop function of my iPhone. So for those of you with an iPhone, um, you can look for it there and you can play with, the, with it to try to line up those edges so that an imperfect photo can be made better. And I will say um, for me, when I address this question of like, what do I see as the biggest mistake that I see um, artists making when they try to represent their work? And it's that they don't photo edit. They just presume that the photo they get is the photo they get. And um, it's not true. I would say pretty much every photo I ever put, ever put up on social media has been edited to some extent. Is that true for you guys? I mean, is, is it a rare photo that gets past you without some sort of editing? I know when we're doing the color matching um, for clients, it takes an hour and multiple um, printed proofs to get the image right. So it is a long involved process um, to really nail it in. Um, the other thing you really, you are dead on accurate with, with the skewing. Uh, but I would like to, to reiterate that it makes life so much easier if you get on the exact same plane as the artwork. And the important reason for that is that if your artwork is at an angle and you're standing straight up and then you skew it in Photoshop, your your um, focal plane is still here. So part of the artwork in the front and part of the artwork in, on the bottom can be out of focus a little bit. Mm -hmm. And if you keep that plane even, if you make sure you're at the same lean or the same tilt as your piece, then you really kind of line up that focal plane with the piece of art. And that's going to give you a sharper image from top to bottom. And that's important. Um, just, that can be distracting just like uh, any kind of, of image skewing or op optical skewing from the wide angle lenses can be. I know some of the newer phones like mine have three different lenses. And if you use a longer lens, instead of using the wide angle, if you use a medium or the long lens and just back up, that'll give you straighter lines because it's not going to skew the image out on the sides. Sorry, I kind of walked off. So maybe step back. Always step back. Mm -hmm. That's that's a pretty simple fix, right? That's a that's a really simple fix, and one that we could all um, maybe benefit from paying attention to. Let's talk about lighting. Um, let's talk about when is kind of when and where and how to achieve the best lighting for uh, the best color representation in artwork. Um, you want to speak to that, Keith? Okay, lighting is really important and it really depends on your subject matter. Um, if your image is behind glass, which is the absolute worst thing that it can be, if you have multiple light sources off to the sides at like a, like a more severe than 45 degree angle, that'll kind of help you come in from the side and minimize that reflection that you're going to have from the glass. Um, 
otherwise you really want to think about what your your work is what the texture of your work is and what you want to get out of the image if you have a high texture piece and you want to show that texture then just like the art itself you want to pay attention to the light and use a stronger light from the side most people don't want that normally you either want a flat even light um, so if you have a, fa a house with a north facing window that can be that can that can work um, but just remember that if you're using natural light so sunlight or skylight you really have to pay attention to the overall color cast that's coming with that a cloudy day or a north facing window is going to give you a cyan or a blue cast to it and if you take it outside and shoot it in direct sunlight you might get more of a yellow a, a warmer cast to it which is more which is we're more used to but you can it can still kind of skew the color palette on the image um if you shoot it outside in direct sunlight you're going to have a snappier more intense color palette so that high contrast with that bright light can exaggerate exaggerate your colors and change it a little bit just like if you shoot it under an incredibly flat light it can soften the colors and kind of mute them out a little bit. Yeah, I, I've found lighting to be um, a real a real challenge. Um, I have a, a deck out back and a lot of times I'll try to get natural light by going out and onto the deck and the odd railing will cast a shadow. Um, you have to be so attentive to where is there a shadow falling across your work and also, what is it next to? Because that phenomenon that we know about as artists of bounced light, it's true in photography too. I have a, a blue wall back there that if I put it next to the blue wall, it will, like you say, um, influence the, the color perception that the camera has um, on, on the photo that I take. So I have to be really careful about what is surrounding me during the photograph and what, what shadows are falling. And then thirdly, what the background is upon which I have my painting. So I'm a watercolorist, so I have to remember to, like all of you are talking about, to photograph before I take it to the framer. I've literally had to unframe things because I forgot that process. But um, if, I, if I do photograph it, I have found that what I photograph against or upon makes a huge difference. If it's on my plastic covered table where there's reflections bouncing off, I don't get the same picture as I do. This is my little makeshift thing. I've covered a board with black velvet. And I mean, it's, I'm no seamstress. I just used my sticky, my sticky tape to, to do this. Um, but that is a, has turned out to be a really wonderful tool to just lay my painting upon so that it's, I don't know, the black seems to allow the lens, there's probably a photography reason for this, um, the lens can open up and um, somehow take in more of the colors in the painting. So that's kind of my um, poor man's fix. Um, for, for some of what you were talking about. William, what do you have to add to this idea of? Well, I think um, you're so right. You have to be very aware of the light source that you're using. And uh, sometimes even you holding your camera over the artwork is gonna cost a shadow, yes. um, depending upon where the light's coming from. So you have to, you have to be aware of that. Um, you know, it's always best if you can, uh, set up a tripod so you're not moving the camera. If you can uh, purchase the little clicker to make your um, take your picture uh, so you're not touching the camera and shaking it, I think it's important. You can use um, some white mat board or white foam core um, to diffuse the light so that it's not you know uh, a glaring light source. You know, help diffuse that as it hits the the artwork as is a, a technique that you can use. Um, but I think one of the, the most important things is what do you plan on doing with that photo? And if you're planning to reproduce your artwork as prints, then I highly recommend you go to Keith and you get a professional 
scan, photograph for reproducing your art and getting it color corrected to look like the artwork you have. Um, it's worth the, I don't know how much you charge, uh, Keith, so it's worth the money because then you have a, a scan that you can keep forever and produce prints from in the long run. So in the long run, it's much better than uh, maybe taking it yourself unless you have a professional setup. Keith, I wanna just plug you, your services as well. Um, we had a question um, about where you're located and um, can you tell everybody where they can find you? Sure, we're located between Grissom and Seaboard in Myrtle Beach. Uh, we're kind of in Industrial Park, uh, 1614 Executive Avenue. Um, anybody can, can, I can message that out later if you like. And um, we have a pink mailbox. So it's kind of a, kind of a very industrial area. So we painted our mailbox pink so everybody can find us. Kind of works out pretty good. But um, his business is 803 Labs in Middle East. And, and you take remote stuff too, right? Yeah, I will go. Um, I will go. I have a couple accounts um, for some art collectors that will go and shoot uh, at their locations because, quite frankly, the, the works are too expensive um, to move. Um, but in those cases, those cases, the lighting is um, incredibly important. And if, if you guys, could see the um, amount of equipment we have to bring in to make sure everything's evenly lit. You, you would be, you would be surprised, and it's really to counter all the things that that you were talking about earlier, the shadows and whatnot. Yeah. So Keith, um, I, there was a question that came in in the comments from Victoria. It was a great question. Watercolor original pieces are often curled or on bumpy paper. Have you ever used non-glare glass laying over the top of a painting before shooting the photo? I, I try to steer away from glass because even non glare glass will um, bring a, um, you, you will pick up some reflection even in non glare, um, but it is definitely better than sh the cheaper normal glass. Um, if I could get it flat without doing that, I, I would do that. Um, but if I had to, you can shoot through glass. Um, I'll tell you one little workaround that I use. Um, I have used I have used Keith's um, services at 803 a lot, especially if, if I know um, that I'm going to do an enlargement of a small piece um, to have a professional shoot at as high resolution as possible with the perfect lighting is, um, was so helpful. In fact, with your help, I was able to take a very small painting about you know, like this. And I think we ended up blowing it up to like six feet tall. Like it was, yeah. it was pretty, and it was pretty amazing. Was pretty like, yeah. so um, I highly recommend that if you're going to be doing enlargements of your work, especially um, that, that that photo that you're working from is essential. However, if you're taking a, a bigger piece and you're making it smaller, the resolution's probably not quite as important, right? You no, know, you'll actually benefit from taking that if you're going from a 30 inch wide piece and bringing it down to a, to a greeting card size, then you're actually gonna benefit from shrinking that image down. So you, you can get away with a lot more. And, and um, while I'd love to see a lot of people um, show up at our, our shop, don't feel like for most of, most of your applications, you can't do it yourself, um, especially for, for submitting um, to some smaller events or doing the social media stuff. A lot of that you can, you can do yourself. Um, yeah, I, I do that. I do that a lot. Most, the majority of my photos are probably ones that I take anymore, but um, I think, I think that that's probably really true for the most part. It's just that if you plan on making and selling prints, I think that's when it becomes a little bit more imperative what your, you know, what your original source for those prints I was going to circle back to um, to a workaround Victoria that um, that I use for gaining a high resolution photo of a bumpy watercolor, and that is to lay it on my flatbed printer and create a scan, because in that way the um, the the cover the lid on the printer actually flattens that image for the moment of um, photography 
and um, getting acquainted. I have a large printer. It's, it's a really nice printer. It's not huge like William. William's got some huge ones in his studio, but um, it is a flatbed and it can print um, a tabloid size piece of paper. So the, the, the scanning bed is quite, is quite large. It accommodates an 11 by 15 watercolor easily. And so that's one workaround that I've had for larger pieces, of course, that wouldn't be possible in an average printer, but it might be a thought for you. Um, I've done that at my husband's office. He has a large flatbed, but uh, I wish lucky. we could have the big ones, the really, really big ones, which you can't. Yeah. William, you have one? <laughs> Unmute. I don't have a scanner, but I have a large printer. Yeah, the scanner is cool. It would be a cool thing for one of our art organizations to purchase and um, allow its members to use. If anyone's out there listening, um, I think I that will would give be a you a little tip on a scanner though. If you have the time and the Photoshop skills, you can, on those larger pieces, you can make multiple passes on the scanner and stitch them together. Um, but if you do not know what you're doing, you can see some obvious um, artifacting and some obvious errors in there where the images don't line up. Oh, that's interesting though. I didn't realize that was possible, but everything's possible in Photoshop, I think. Unfortunately. <laughs> that's so true, that's so true. Um, I think that, you know, we've talked a little bit about lighting. Um, I know, William, one question that came up for me when you mentioned the white matte background as an alternative to my black velvet background. Can you guys speak from your more um, vantage point of being having a little more expertise? What's the best color background in order to promote the best color perception um, for a camera? I think it, it, it's, it's between three things, a gray, a white, or a black, just a oh. neutral color. Okay. Um, the classic is at 18% gray. Um, there's a reason why a gray card is, is in classic photography is a gray card. Um, it also, if you use that neutral 18% gray, you can, um, it makes it easier for you to balance the colors on the other side. Oh, that's interesting. So maybe instead of a black velvet, I should have invested in gray velvet. <laughs> that could be a thought. If you're out there gonna go shop for some velvet, you may wanna think about buying some gray instead of the black. Um, if any of you guys have, um, questions for us, please feel free to submit them in the chat or to unmute yourself and um, pipe in with questions. We're certainly welcome to do that. My two guests here today, just to remind you um, who we're talking to, is one, Keith Jacobs from 803 Labs, a professional photojournalist and um, photographer print specialist from Myrtle Beach. And then uh, William Miller, who is um, coming at this conversation from um, a digital career. Have you have you talked to us about your background? Did we do that? A little bit at the beginning, yeah. Uh, okay. I worked for a digital uh, computer graphic uh, uh, ad agency in New York when yeah. I started for 12 and a half years. And me, I'm just a middle-aged artist. I mean, I, I really have no expertise other than um, the fact that I'm out here just learning the hard way, most everything that I know, but wanting certainly to share what it is that I've been able to learn and um, maybe just hopefully help other people learn from my mistakes and um, my friends. So thanks, thanks for, for joining me today. Um, let's talk about, let's talk about reproduction. Um, you know, and photographing for reproduction. What kind of advice would you guys have for, um, for those of us who might be interested in reproducing our work? William, would you like to start that one? Well, uh, my, my first thing would be go hire Keith. <laughs> <laughs> um, Great. I mean, other than that, if you want to do it yourself, then you have to pay close attention to um the lighting the cropping the um uh the color thing one of the things that you might want to do so that you can properly color balance your work is um get a um a gray scale and um and even a primary color scale um and uh take your picture with those in mind because those are easier 
um, for you to balance against to get the right proper colors um, if you're going to do it yourself. And again, file size, I think if you're going to be reproducing uh, is really important. You want to make sure you have a high resolution um, to print from. Well, go big. Yeah. Go big. Um, Keith, can you add to that at all? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm definitely one of the things to remember is you want to keep that image flat. So if you're setting up a station for yourself to shoot, um, if you are doing it for print reproduction, you probably need to move up to a SLR of some sort. Um, some of the cell phones might be able to hold up, but you're, you're, if, especially if you're going bigger than two foot, you're going to start seeing some artifacting. Um, and then take your time. I, I think William touched on a tripod before. A tripod is incredibly important. Not only does it keep you from shaking, it makes you slow down. So with it, with your camera or your cell phone on a tripod, because they make cell phone adapters for, tri for tripods, it'll make you slow down. It'll help you grid it out. It'll help you stop, make, make sure everything's kind of lined up. And then um, if you're doing it inside, all those elements that we talked before, the color of the walls, which way the light's coming in and what the reflections are, are so incredibly important. Okay, that's, that's, all good. Um, that's all good information. There was a question that came in about um, the clicker that you displayed, William. Um, can you show that once more? And it's a remote. Sure. Actually, it came with a, uh, with the world's coolest selfie stick by ClickFi. And uh, I got it at Best Buy. It came with a, um, a nice little tripod that you can put your, your phone into. And then it tells you how to link your phone with the clicker so that you can set this up and stand away from it and take a picture. And it's a selfie stick, so you can have fun with that as well. Yeah, that's that's a cool little gadget, and we all we all love just one more thing to to get for ourselves. How about um, lighting? Um, Bev Davis wanted to to know um, about lighting. It's I noticed that somebody asked what um what light I should buy um if you're going to get a light. I will say this: it is really hard to light artwork with a single light. Um, you the the name of the game in in sheen and reproduction is evenness on a light. And if you have a light off to the side, that side is always gonna be hotter than the other side. Um, so you really at a minimum need two lights. Um, when, when I, uh, I'm, you know, I, I've been in the business for a long time, so I have a big kit. When I shoot artwork, I have four big lights with big soft boxes, um, but that's kind of a little ridiculous. So if you have at least two, um, that'll get you a long way there. If you're shooting really, really large pieces, and you have them off to the side, you're still gonna pick up hot spots on the corners. The hot, if you move the lights farther away, the hot spots won't be as bad. Remember, the power of your light is directly proportional to the distance of it. So it'll be twice as bright, half the distance. So the farther you move it back, the, um, the farther you, you move it back, the more even a wash of light's gonna be because the distance from the edge of the art to the other edge of the art is minimized in, um, as that distance goes backwards. So when you say soft light, I'll just I'll just kind of pan my um, camera over. I've got a soft light, and it's it's just a big fluorescent covered with um, a soft piece of gauzy material. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, you can uh, you can get away with LED lights with a scrim, which would be basically any kind, basically a sheet or any cheesecloth or something like that. Um, there's tons of, of more professional setups um, if you wanted that. What you really, as a rule, don't want is the um, LED pinpoint light bank. Um, I, I've seen some, some shots come in with that, but they, um, the ones I've seen so far have been um, a little, pick up little speculars on the high points of the art. Um, which is can that be like a burnout? Is that like? Yeah, yeah, especially if the art's got a lot of texture to it. So if it's painting and there's a lot of texture to it, the speculars will pick up and it'll kind of throw throw the color off, but that's being real nitpicky. If you're just putting it online, it, it might not be worth um, doing that. Um, but yeah, a big, big panels on the sides that are even, you know, even distance away. Um, that, that can really make, make a big difference. Like I say in, in my photography classes, uh, a lot of, 
of the photograph and getting the image is the talent of, of the photographer, but that only takes you to about this level. After that, you got to invest in the equipment. Yeah, and and always, I think anymore, those of us who are pretty much working with just digital photos, I'll always be open to photo editing too. Um, Keith, you make a good point. Um, Keith Mir, the um, she, he makes a, a point in the in the notes here that for a, for the advanced Photoshop users, when um, when you have a very skewed image from a photograph, all is not lost. You can save the image by using distort, which is a function that you can find under transform. And I think that's a little bit of what you were talking about, William, when you talked about skew. Um, you called it um, a skew function, I think. Yeah, that's skew is uh, it's more straight lines where I think distort um, uh, uses arrows and you can you can bend things mm -hmm. where um, I just kind of straighten out the edges with the skew. It's um, it, I think when we when we set about transforming our image, we have to be. Can we talk a little bit about aspect ratio because I think that's a um, that's something that maybe is not altogether intuitive for, for most people, um, but it's so important uh, when you change and, and edit your photo rather than elongating it or widening it, um, keeping that aspect ratio the same is so important. Um, Keith Jacobs, can you talk about that? Yes, please do not stretch your images to fit the, um, to fit the space that, that just, kind of destroys the image. Um, this is one of those reasons why it's so important to back up a little bit. If you shoot a little bit loose in the image, then you can use the same photo for um, Instagram as you could for Photoshop. As we talked about before, the aspect ratio of the Instagram photo is one to one. There's score there. The, Insta the, the um, aspect ratio for a um, Facebook photo is like 1.6 by one. So it's more of a wide horizontal. So if you step back and keep in mind that um, that you're shooting it for photoshopping a little extra bits of edge on the end, then you can crop it down if it's square for Instagram. If you're shooting a square piece, you have to make sure you back up far enough that it's going to fit in in um, in the Photoshop. It's you, you, think about it like this. Think about it like you are photographing for a magazine cover. Just imagine that in your head. So you have time that goes on top of the magazine. You have to have photo in there and then you have to have uh, enough room for those words on top and the words on bottom. And that'll kind of give you a mental picture of where it needs to fit and some space and everything else has to be extra fluff. We, um, we're kind of losing your audio and your Sorry video about that. Yeah, is that better? Down a little bit. Um, but I think what he was saying is that if in the Time Magazine cover, you'll you have to leave space if you're if you're thinking of it that way you have to leave space for where the words might go across the top one thing that i will just offer here at to to address you know how do you take a photo that's um, upright rectangle and upload it so that you can see the whole image on instagram which requires uh square formatting for most of its posts what i do is i use an app <laughs> and um, there's an app called Square Fit that's an Apple app, but I'm sure there's an equivalent on Android. And Square Fit is a way that you can just load your, um, your photo into the app and um, you can, it will superimpose, well, it will put behind your painting a square format. And then you can choose a color that is, um, agreeable with the image or you can even use um i guess they've got like a, a, a some sort of function that allows for a, a, an image a distorted image of your own image to go behind and so there's a lot of things that square fit can do for you it can even put um words on top of your art so like it, let's say you wanted to add some text to an image um, that square fit is a is a really nice little app and I, I don't even think I paid for it so um, if you don't know about it it might be one for you to check out and does anybody know is there an Android equivalent since I'm an Apple person my husband calls me an itard um, 
<laughs> if there's an Android equivalent, I would, I would be interested and perhaps somebody else would be interested in that too. Feel free to put that in the, uh, in the chat here and I'll try to draw attention to it as we go. If we have, yeah. go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just gonna say, uh, you may not know, be aware of this, but when you go to uh, Instagram, I don't know if you can see that, I just uh -huh. took this vertical photograph. But while you're in that, if you pinch your fingers and you can shrink it and you can make it vertical, so it doesn't have to be, and then you can post a vertical photograph. Well, there you go. I see this is why it's so great for us to share like this because there are often these little tricks of the trade that you just don't know and they may be obvious to one person but maybe not so obvious to you so thanks for sharing that there's also a little button could you show your screen again since you had it up there there's sure. also a little um arrow button that kind of goes out on the diagonal and it can shrink your image down to a more square format too that and then there's the little pix app which is the little squares where you can choose to put multiple photos right a layout i think it's layout mm -hmm. um, yeah. and that can make a collage of of a of a number of um your images so yeah those are all that's a cool um another cool function that you can use to just kind of cheat the process if you if you didn't factor all this in ahead of time i i guess i was going to ask you keith when you say shoot it loosely and include more of the background. That would be dangerous for me when I'm shooting on a a smaller um, a smaller uh, piece of the black velvet. Um, I guess it might mean that a, a bigger uh, background might be better than you know than not. Well, we got a couple of tricks for you here. Let me show you. Um, if if you don't, I can give you a couple little. Um, samples i'm gonna share my screen if that's okay sure um <clears throat> so if we look here at this video or this bus because i'm at a bus station so this is appropriate right um i shot this loose so what that means is i have a lot of space here on this side and a lot of space on the other side so if i need to crop it to say six inch by six inch to fit, which would be square, I have exactly amount the amount of room I need. Yeah. And if I want it to go on Facebook and it's more of a horizontal, then I still have enough room. Now I shot at a high enough res that it's gonna be sharp enough either way. But if you do have the image that's the wrong size and you need it square in Photoshop, you can go back to, um, image canvas size and if you match your canvas size height and width then it'll just add the lines for you so now i have a um, square image that can go back in um so that's quick and easy and and down and dirty um but that's the importance of shooting it loose so yeah. if you sh if you do have a black if you use a black velvet background you can add those black borders in super quick and easy with photoshop but if you shoot it loose you don't have to necessarily um if you have the ability to shoot it loose and you don't mind what the background looks like, then you can crop it as you go. Well, that's, that's a really good um, example of why shooting more than what you think you need is probably a good idea. Um, Victoria, what did you mean when it doesn't always work for our taller paintings? Are you thinking about Using Instagram, I have tried that shrinking thing and still can't, if we, have a, if we have a more vertical painting, you still can't fit it all in there. At least that's been my experience. That's been mine too, which is why I, I, I use that square fit. Sometimes. Now I just downloaded the square fit and I'm trying to figure it out. Do you input your photo into a background on square fit? Yes, that's what you do, but okay. it's superimposed over the background. so. It, you know, it gives you the option to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to fool with that. Yeah, you'll have fun with it. Good. I hope that's a helpful thing for you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think that there's all kinds of apps out there. Sometimes, you know, knowing which ones are the ones that can be helpful. 
is tricky. Um, but there's certainly, gosh, there's certainly so much to learn. Um, we're kind of approaching the end of our hour. If there are particular questions out there, I'd be really interested in what you had to say. And I'd also be interested in some, just some closing thoughts if, um, if William, if you've got some thoughts that you'd like to share to just kind of wind things up, I'd be interested. Uh, sure, well, one of the things is um, uh, a good way to get that flat um, uh, so you can use the grid properly is to hang your artwork on the wall. Um, and if you're, if you're using paper or whatever, you know, get some a clear um, thumb, thumbtacks uh, so that you can pin it because those are easy to crop out and easy also to um, get rid of in the editing process if you need to. Um, you can also, if, you're, if your work is stiff enough, uh, you can also use the, the clear thumbtacks to create a little ledge that you can uh, put paper and stuff on. Um, but if you have a, a, a wired um, uh, piece of art, hang it up and, and, and shoot it flat on the wall. And that'll also help you with uh, the lighting because you'll be able to see how the, the shadows of the artwork fall on the wall. That's so funny because I'm just picturing myself. I mean, I'm just being flat out honest here. I'm picturing myself standing over my painting on the floor and trying to get my camera dead center and exactly even. I mean, I'm, I'm just being transparent here. That's, that's often what I end up doing. Um, so if you're like me, maybe we should be, instead of trying to do that, maybe we should be putting it up on a wall and then trying to get some nice flat light on it. That's a good suggestion, William. That's a really good suggestion. Uh, Keith, t any, any like final nuggets of wisdom? You know, that, wall, that wall technique works great. It keeps it flat. It helps you stay forward. Don't be scared to put it on an easel if you don't have a wall. Um, we use easels all the time. You got a little tilt to that, but you should be able to match that tilt. And like I said, just be aware of um, what your in use of the artwork is for. Um, because those, those different photo techniques, uh, you have a lot more latitude for the stuff going online than you do for catalogs. And um, there's no need in spending five hours if, if you can do it in a half hour. Um, and if you guys have any questions, just please feel free to reach out. I would like to say though, if you're coming to see, um, see me at the office, Rich is the guy who does our, our artwork. So you're gonna wanna talk to him and not me. He's actually better at it than I am. <laughs> Yeah, Rich is is the man. He is all about, uh, I, I can just tell you that when he color matches, I have trouble, I, I have trouble distinguishing the original from um, the, the print, except with certain colors. I have found that teal and red yeah. are kind of demons. Mm -hmm. And um, those colors can be very difficult for, for the printer to translate for some reason um but their work there is really top notch and and i would highly recommend them if you're at all in, in the market for really quality reproduction stuff here in the myrtle beach area um i would like to just ask a question just real quickly before we end what about um time of day like if you had to say what is the ideal time of day to shoot for the best color representation, what would that be? Um, for me, it really depends on that effect that sh that you want to go. If you want to go with strong poppy colors, I would probably do it um, more early morning, late afternoon, so I can get a more direct light. Um, if you want it to be muted and really soft, then it's not really time of day, but it's waiting for that like overcast day. Yeah. Uh, so you have very large light source and that really softens that image. I know, I, I think for me, my best days for photography are cloudy. <laughs> you know, they're, where it's, it's bright cloudy, but it's, it's kind of flat light. And then, you know, the shadows are less of an issue and um, either that or something other, for the most part, um, something other than noon um, seems to be a, a better time of day for me. Um, and William, do you have anything else you would add? No, I, I agree. Um, you know, cloudy days are the best because, you know, with, with uh, a bright sunshine, you're definitely going to 
be battling the shadows and um, uh, also glare. Yeah. yeah well, if you're doing if you're doing bright sunshine, you almost it has to be pretty close to dir to to directly hitting it, um, and that's a technique that you have to learn. We I would the only time I would ever do that is if I was really trying to exaggerate the um, contrast of the images. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think doing it at two in the morning in your studio with, you know. <laughs> but after a few Perfect glasses timing. of wine, that's always a bad idea. <laughs> I would not recommend that. Oh gosh, well, this has been fun. I want to invite all of you to think about returning next week. I'm going to be, um, at this time also, we'll be offering another Friday freebie and um, we'll be discussing keeping an inventory and just thoughts for maybe how to do that and why to do that. Because if you're like me, you had to be really convinced that it was necessary before you went to all of that trouble. Um, and so for those of us who've um, got, you know, kind of a, a lot of work that we've done over time, it's, it really has become necessary. And I, for one, wish that somebody had kicked me in the butt very early on and said, you really need to buckle down and do this. So that's why I, I chose it as a topic for us to address next week. And that will be our next, um, our next event. And you really do need to sign up via Eventbrite in order for all the automations to come to you with reminders and links and all of that. We're not charging you for this, but that is like a step that we're asking everybody to take. So rather than waiting till the last minute and trying to, um, you know, think, well, why can't I join? Really think uh, if you're at all inclined to, um, to come, just go ahead and sign up. It's not going to cost you anything. And, and then you'll get everything that you need well in advance. I also will be offering a Zoom class, um, a watercolor Zoom class in um, teaching how to paint uh, turtles, loggerhead turtles. And it's the second in a series of classes on that subject with a second approach. And I'm really looking forward to it. Our last class was fun. We had a lot of wonderful exchange between us and we were able to um, leave the class with a complete painting. So that was kind of a fun paint along. If you're at all interested in that, please follow me on social media, um, Facebook, Rebecca Z Artist, and also on Instagram at Rebecca Z Artist. And you can also visit my website, RebeccaZArtist.com. William, where can we find you online? You can find me at WilliamHMiller.com or you can find me on Facebook and uh, Instagram under Wim Designs. Cool. And Keith, do you have a place that we can look for you online? Yeah, of course, you can find um, us at 803labs.com. If you're looking more for my um, photography stuff, you can go to keithallenjacobs.com and the corresponding Facebook and Twitter pages. Okay, very good. Well, I want to thank all of you for your time and attention. We're slightly over, so I'm going to end it here and say thanks. And I really enjoyed this discussion. Thanks to my guests. Thanks to all of you for your great questions. Have a great day and hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.